happens when we age in our face and uh, what are the surgical and some of the non-surgical uh, options available. Uh, I love talking about the face because the story of what happens to the face is uh, very um, is very unique. Unlike any other parts of the body, it's very predictable. Things happen in a in a in a certain fashion. Um, aesthetically appealing eyelids, right? So the face. The first signs of aging are the eyelids. When I do surgery, my youngest facial plastic surgery patients are the eyelid, the upper eyelids and the lower eyelid patients because we age from middle of our face to the outside, we age from south to north. So the eyelids are the first part, followed by the neck, followed by the rest of the face. And if you look at, for example, Angelina Jolie for an aesthetically appealing eyelid, you want to be able to see the eyelid crease, which is depending on your uh, genetics and ethnicity, is about two to three millimeter of a of crease that you see over your lash line. What happens with aging is the lateral side of the eyebrow comes down, the eyelid gets heavy, and it causes the lateral hooding, as you're going to see in the next. This is a classic exaggerated version of what brings people to our office, right? You start noticing extra skin in your lash, in your upper eyelid. You start noticing that your eyebrow is kind of lower. People say, you know, when I put uh, makeup on, it doesn't stay on my lashes. It gets on the skin because I have so much crowding of the upper eyelid. People say, I look sad, I look tired, and they wonder why. And some others, instead of developing extra skin in their eyelids, they get hollowness uh, in their eyelids. For example, Angelina Jolie at 23, 30, and 42, you can see that from left to right, she doesn't have extra skin. All she has is hollowness of the medial part of her eyelids right under her eyebrows. Uh, she has this sunken look. And that means that she's lost some fat in her upper eyelid. And believe it or not, just like the bone in, in the rest of your body, when you get osteoporosis, you can actually lose bone density in your face. It causes things like jawline not being as, as strong or the eyes looking slightly sunk in, as is the case with Angelina Jolie. So what do we do for that? If someone like her comes in, as in this patient, she thought she needed an eyelid lift, but she doesn't really have extra skin, does she? All she has is hollowness of her upper eyelid, on the, uh, you can see in the after photos, she, we put fat injection. We injected fat to her upper eyelid and her eyebrow, and that gave her that youthful look back. All that changed is that she has less shadows in her upper eyelid. She has that less of a sunken look. And of course, she got a CO2 laser to resurface her skin, but the wow factor in this before and after is mainly a few cc of fat injected to her upper eyelids and no skin removed, no scars. Same patient from, a, from a, a, an oblique view, that gives you a better appreciation of the beautiful fullness that she has in her upper eyelid and eyebrow and is missing it in her before photo, giving her that darker sunken look. So the surgery, if you do truly have extra skin, the surgery is very simple. We remove a strip of skin from your upper eyelid. It leaves you a very thin and tiny scar in your upper eyelid. The good news is as long as you're looking at someone, the, eye, the scar always falls behind your eyelids. So nobody can really see it unless somebody's staring at you when you are sleeping. They might be able to see a very fine white line behind your eyelids. Can this I ask you a question, Dr. Akimi? Is this done under a local or general? This is under local. It's, oh. it's such a minor procedure. It takes about one hour skin to skin. And we numb you up with a couple of cc of lidocaine. Uh, you close your eyes, and when you open your eyes in about an hour, the surgery is done. The sutures come out at about seven days after the surgery. So this is, uh, my goal is by the end of this slideshow, you can appreciate what needs to be done, and you can see what an aesthetically pleasing upper or lower eyelid looks like. This is a young gal in her 40s, right? This is one of the youngest procedures we do. You can see the crowding of her upper eyelids in the before photos and in the after, you can see a very nice two to three millimeter, millimeter crease in her upper eyelid where she can put her makeup on and she has almost zero crow's feet or wrinkles on the outer side of her eyelids. All we did is we removed the strip of skin under local anesthesia. Another patient, different age, but same problem, right? She has crowding of her upper eyelid. You can see right under her eyebrow that the, the, the beautiful crease that I've been showing you is disrupted by crowding of the upper eye, uh, by the crowding of the upper eyelid. We remove the extra skin and you can see a beautiful uh, curve in the upper eyelid crease and no wrinkles. Uh, the, there is also always natural. It's really hard to make these patients unnatural because 
it's a very conservative surgery. All we're doing is we're removing the skin. I barely ever touch, touch the muscle or the fat because majority of people, we want to keep that fullness. It's a youthful look. Another patient with a slightly different anatomy, she has so much skin laxity that it's covering her lashes. It's sitting on the lash line. And now you, on the after photos, you can see the upper eyelid crease beautifully um, three months post-surgery. Next so slide. Dr. Akimi, yes. how long does the surgery last before the skin starts to sag again? It's very, it's very difficult to predict for eyelid surgery. I say for a face procedure, a facial rejuvenation procedure lasts somewhere between seven to 10 years. It's very hard to tell how fast one comes back with an upper or lower eyelid. The eyelid surgeries last much longer, somewhere close to 10 to 20 years. They're very much genetically driven how they age. And it, it, it depends on a lot of other anatomical issues. It's very, I've never seen someone yet to come back less than 10 to 12 years after a surgery. Um, another patient, again, these are all younger patients. You can see the crowding and the fullness of her upper eyelid. One would look and think that she has even extra fat behind her eyelids, but just removing the skin opened up her eyelids. It's something that looks like her. Genetically, that's what she looks like. She said, I look now like what I did when I was in my 20s. And all she wanted was to get that upper eyelid crease back so she can put makeup and eyeshadow on. And you can see that the lateral hooding in the bottom photos in the uh, oblique view, the lateral hooding is completely gone and she has a very open upper eyelid. So uh, when we move from upper eyelids, there's also an eyebrow issue, right? I don't know how many of you have seen this uh, version of this magazine. They found the same girl in Afghanistan 14 or 17 years later, identical picture. Uh, her eyelids haven't changed much. What has changed is her eyebrows have come down by a few millimeters. But then also look at the lower part of her face. She has a wider lower face with some evidence of jowl formation, uh, but not, change in, in not that many changes in her eyebrows. How is an eyebrow lift done? If the crowding of your upper eyelid is from a brow droopiness, the surgery that you're going to need is an, eyelid, is an eyebrow lift. There are many different versions of eyebrow lift. The one that's most commonly performed, and I do it the most, is what we call a temporal brow lift, which will involve an incision that's in the temporal border uh, part of your scalp, where the hair bearing part ends and the non-hair bearing starts. And this is where the scar would be in a, uh, in a patient. And all it does is it brings the lateral tail of your eyebrow up. So can I ask you... Can I ask a quick question from Elizabeth? Is there an age limit for this type of surgery? No, there's no, there's nothing that there's no one that's too young. I mean, obviously, um, within reasonable age, but no, there's no there's no such thing as too young or too old for any of these procedures. Now, the older you get, probably the severity is more. Uh, you know, sometimes when patients come in their 80s or 90s, sometimes they need both an eyebrow lift and an eyelid lift. But then again, age doesn't dictate. For example, interestingly enough, this patient is in his 40s, in her 40s, the patient that you're looking at in your monitor, she has severe brow ptosis, droopiness of her eyebrows and skin laxity of her upper eyelid. This is what she looks like one week after an eyebrow lift and an eyelid lift, right? I haven't even removed her sutures in this photo yet. Uh, but you can see already the improvement um, that it's made one week out. This is her six months out, right? All the swelling gone, the incision is completely healed, barely anything noticeable. You can see how much more open her eyelid, uh, eyes look, the eyebrow tail is higher, her eyes, the green, the color of her eyes are more noticeable because there is more opportunity for the light to hit the eyes and reflect so you can appreciate the color of her eyes more. This patient thought she needed an eye, eyelid lift. She came into my office asking for an eyelid lift. When we looked at her, she has brow droopiness and she has hollowness of her eyes. So this, as in the after photos, she's three months after an eyebrow lift and fat injection to her upper eyelid. There's no scar around her eyes because there's a scar in her scalp that we elevated the tail of her brow and we injected some fat eyes that was from uh, a loss of fat and bone around the eyeball. So we covered the upper eyelid, we covered the brow. Let's talk about the lower eyelid, right? Everyone has fat under their eyelids. Um, that fat usually is, is held in place with a muscle and a skin layer that is not really noticeable until you hit a certain age. Now, at certain age, for some people it happens in their 40s, for some people it happens in their 80s. The skin and muscle start to get loose and the fat that was being held back 
kind of protrudes and herniates into your cheek. And that's what gives you that puffy look to the lower eyelids. So the treatment, as you can imagine, is to address the, address the fat. In some younger individuals, when they don't have that much extra skin and their problem is an isolated fat problem, we go from inside the eyelid. When you sleep, we flip the eyelid, we make an incision, and we tease out the fat. They will recover without any scars. For some others, when they also have a lot of wrinkles in their eyelids and they need skin to be removed, we do this part and then we go from outside and we make a very, very thin incision right underneath their lash line by like two or three millimeter distance. And we remove a strip of skin from outside to address both the fat and the skin layer. This is a patient that under, uh, underwent an, a lower eyelid lift. She had both fat removed and um, a strip of skin removed from her eyelids. You can see the smooth transition between her lower eyelid and the cheek junction. Uh, and the, scars is, the scar is not noticeable at all much more severe case, right? This is 10 times worse than the first patient with a lot of previous pre-existing deformity of her, his lower eyelids. We removed some fat and some skin. Uh, she's in her 50s. She had bulging of fat in both of her eyelids and she had some extra skin. You can imagine if you remove the, remove the fat from her eyelids, it doesn't really address the skin problem. She would have had a deflated lower eyelid look. So we the, removed some fat and removed the strip of skin. You can see the beautiful smooth transition between her lower eyelids and her cheek. Let's go through this one, one, two, three. Um, so a few things happen as we age. You get skin damage, sun damage uh, from uh, sun exposure, air pollution. You go, you get your facials, hydrofacial laser surgery, laser procedure to remove that sun damage, that external damage that's done to your face. Then the skin sags, gravity always wins. That's why the face goes down, neck goes down, eyelids go down. And that's where the radio frequency skin tightening or the surgical lift comes into play. The third factor that barely is talked about is the fat deflation. The fat that's in your cheeks also goes down, but also the area that is left also atrophies and becomes thinner. So every time people come in to talk about the facelift or facial rejuvenation, we always talk about replenishing, uh, revolumizing their, their fat because just a pulled look is not a youthful look. A youthful look also has volume in it. And that's been probably the most dramatic change in facelift that we do today versus 40 years ago is that instead of just pulling more, we fill the face so that we don't have to fill as much. And that's what gets you a more natural result. Um, we age from south to north. We talked about this schematic view of what a facelift is, right? On the left side, you can see the incision diagram that goes around your ear, behind your ear, into your hairline. We lift the skin and then we reach to that yellow and red part that you see in the diagram uh, and we tighten up the muscle underneath the skin. The stitches that you see on the right side, you will never see them because they happen under your skin, they're well hidden. Those stitches help to uh, tighten up the muscle underneath your skin. And then we pull the skin over and redrape the, sk the, the skin over the muscle. And that's how you get from A to B. It's not just a skin lift, it's also a muscle lift. For the facelift, and you need that to be able to address the nasolabial fold, the marionette line, and the uh, fullness in the neck. Dr. Akimi, someone's asking, Diane is asking, what do you do back to the eyes? What do you do if the under, or under eye hollows out? Uh, there's a slide at the very end of this um, slideshow. Uh, we can also do fat injection to the lower eyelids. There are a few photos of it in this. Uh, if you have a good injector that likes to inject fillers to the lower eyelids, uh, people that get good results, they can also provide you with that. In my hands, I love doing fat grafting. I think it's a, like a paintbrush. I can do more with it. Not infrequently, we, we, we replenish that hollowness with, uh, with fat. Now, this is what brings women to my office. You can see the two bands, right? They, uh, the, the, the bands that you notice in your neck, they're there even in your 40s and 50s. Regardless of what news channels you got watched tonight, when you look at the news anchors, the ones in their 40s and 50s, when they're talking on TV, you can see these bands getting activated because these bands are the muscle, uh, the neck muscles that when we talk, they get activated and they, they show up. Now, in, after a certain age, let's say 60 and 70, the bands are there even when you don't talk. And the problem with non-surgical skin tightening is that it doesn't address the muscle. So for patients that come in and have bands, I always tell them you have two options for the bands. In early stages, maybe in your 50s, you can Botox the bands, just like you Botox your forehead. Botoxing the bands makes it weaker, and it wouldn't activate, makes the bands look softer. 
or in, uh, if you're having a surgical procedure like a neck or a facelift, we make a small incision under your chin and we go in and we sew the muscle bands together so it conforms to your neck better. And this is a diagram of what you just saw. You remember those bands? Now you can see the edges. Those are the edges of the two muscles in your neck that are very wide and they hug your neck content. But as we age, the edges start to separate and then they show. So in a, in a facelift or neck lift procedure, there is a small incision under your chin and we sew them together. We nick the muscle so it conforms and contours to your neck much better. This is a patient on the operating table. A facelift is almost done at this point. The skin is undermined. The skin is, the, the muscle is already tightened up and we're redraping the skin. As you can see, there's no pool on the skin. This is a classic incision six months later, right? I put the diagram next to it so you can see where you would expect this, uh, the scar, but it's barely noticeable if you don't know where to look for it. What next happens one. if a patient is prone to scar tissue? A lot of patients are concerned about, you know, uh, forming keloids, hypertrophic scars, darker scars. Uh, somehow face doesn't do it as much. Majority of people that have problem with the their body, it shows more because there is more tension. There is more movement in the face that we don't really pull too tight. As I said a few seconds ago, we tighten up the muscle and we redrape the skin. So if you have a good surgeon and they don't pull the skin and there's not much tension on the skin, it's very rare to have this complication of having, you know, darker scar, thicker scar. That's not to say it's a zero, but it, I wouldn't avoid a facelift because of that, because it's very, very hard to get it in the face. Now, for some patients, if they do develop it, we always, uh, injecting steroid is an option. Using scar cream is an option. I barely do it, but I've had occasional patients that genetically they've had such a predisposition that immediately after the surgery, we put them on scar treatment. And a few months later, we injected steroid to prevent any sort of hyperpigmentation or thickening of the scar. So um, the, the, the pictures on the left are an older version of a facelift that they used to do. In the past, there was a very good intention of uh, bringing the scar into your hairline to avoid the scar. But what, what, with people that have too much skin laxity, as you can see, if the neck is pulled into your hair, the non-hair bearing part of the skin is going to get transferred and cause a dent in your hairline. A modern facelift involves an inverted V scar, which means goes up behind your ear and then follows your hairline, follows the baby hair around your hairline all the way down. For a few weeks, maybe a couple of months, you may not be able to wear a tight ponytail, but as long as you're, until this scar matures and becomes very uh, fine and white and not noticeable, but as long as your hair is down, nobody's gonna notice it. The beauty of this method is it saves your precious hair bearing scalp. People don't wanna look tight. You know, we know now that a, a young face is not a tight old face. When you look at Mila Kunis, it, there's nothing tight about her face. She has volume and she has no skin redundancy. And that's what we're trying to accomplish when we design someone's uh, facelift to see what they look like in their 20s and 30s. Where did they have volume? Where did they not have this much skin? 65 year old patient, 150 pound weight loss after gastric bypass. You can see the severe, severe skin laxity in her neck. She doesn't have that many bands. Usually this is a weight loss problem. People that have just one uh, row of extra skin in the middle of their neck. And she can see the loss of definition in her jawline. Now you could look at her face and say, you know, she could also have a brow lift and an eyelid lift, but that was not her problem. She came in saying, I just want my neck to look better. This is her two years after a lower facelift and neck. Wow. She doesn't look any different. She just has a more defined jawline and she doesn't have the extra skin in her neck. You can see the improvement in her neck. These are all animations, sorry, might be a lot of mix. Um, this is her from a frontal view. You can see uh, the nasolabial fold, the marionette lines are so much better. She has more volume in her upper part of her face and her neck looks like what it did you know, a few decades ago without looking different at all. This is her the day after the surgery. This is what every single one of my patients look like after the surgery. I don't wrap them. There is no dressing on your face. There's a little bit of ointment around your incision. You bring a very light scarf. You go home at the same night. There is a drain in your neck that comes out the next day. And the stitches in front of your ear are removed exactly seven days after the surgery. The stitches behind your ear are removed two weeks after the surgery. Then after that, I see you every, every other month uh, probably one to three months after the surgery. And then every six months we see each other. 
by the time usually up by the three months they're so nor back to normal and they look so good that it's really hard to get them back in the office and as far as recovery goes if you want to look good in a photo you need three months if you want to look good in public give me three weeks and four weeks and you'll be fine in public but photo has this ability of being able to uh, pinpoint the the surgical changes or the or the swelling so well that if somebody wants to go to a wedding i tell them to plan this three months ahead of time and you'll be fine uh, so this is a young gal uh, in her 50s avid runner uh, she came in for consultation uh, you can see the issues in her face sun damage yes loss of volume yes um, skin laxity around her mouth she has that frown look around her mouth and she has both the bands and the wrinkly skin in her neck the photo on the very right where she's wearing red is her only one week after the facelift surgery. You would see her on the street. It wouldn't, she wouldn't scare you. You wouldn't guess that she had a facelift done. And uh, this is her, the middle one is her three months after a facelift. You can see the dramatic improvement in her face and neck. This is her from an oblique view. The incisions are pretty uh, healed. You can see the beautiful straight jawline. You can see the uh, resolution of all the bands in her neck and the resolution of the nasolabial fold near your neck lines are completely gone. She looks completely like herself, right? She looks like what she did 20, 30 years ago. Neck completely uh, flat, nasolabial folds improved, and she has more volume in her cheeks. Another patient in her 70s, she's had, to, uh, she's had another facelift before. When you look at her, she wants another facelift, but facelift is not her main wow factor here. She's also lost a lot of volume, and that's the case mostly with people uh, in their 60s and 70s. On the right side, she, it's her uh, three months after a facelift surgery, but also volume replacement. You can see her cheeks, the improvement in her cheek volume, the lower eyelid, and the temporal hollowness that's much less. A uh, hallmark of turning 40 for women is, lossing, is loss of um, fat and loss of volume in their temples. They love wearing bangs and they don't know why bangs makes them look so much younger. It's because it gives you that convexity that you've had in your 20s and 30s. And so not infrequently when we do a facelift, we add fat injection to the temple area to give you that beautiful look back again. You can see also the improvement in her upper eyelids. We didn't do an upper eyelid lift. Yes, you guessed it right. We also did fat injection to her upper eyelid. It gave her that fullness of her uh, eyebrows back and took away from that dark shadow around her eyes. She looks less sunk in. And of course, we did a facelift on her, so she has less uh, fold around her mouth and less wrinkles in her neck. A same patient from a different view. You can see the uh, improvement in her cheeks by, re uh, by volumizing her cheeks and also the very straight uh, jawline that she has, not to mention the very strong model-like look that she has in her eyes because that sunk thin uh, look is gone now. Now she has that strength in her eyes, which is only two or three cc's of fat in her eyebrows and nothing else. Same patient, different view. Looks like herself a few decades ago. Another patient, uh, this one hasn't lost much face, much, much volume, right? She has a very full face. She just feels like she looks uh, tired and sad. And the reason is just gravity. She has very deep nasolabial folds on near your neck lines uh, before and after. And she has very, very strong bands in her neck. This is her three months after a facelift procedure without any fat injection. Same patient, different view. Majority of these people, patient ask me what type of laser they did. Not that not all of them get laser surgery, but I truly think that the fat injection to the face has some stem cell quality that does improve the uh, quality of the skin. That's why majority of these people, their skin looks better, but not every single one had a, um, a laser procedure done. Now, just bragging about scars again, you know, it's, it's very, um, uh, it's hard to tell. This is another patient three months after, and I put the diagram next to it so you can see the scars for yourself. Another patient, 77 years old, okay? Three months after facelift and fat augmentation. Look at her face from left to right. She looks sad. She has that sunken look in her eyes. She has the shadow in the upper eyelid. She doesn't need an eyelid lift. All we did was a lower facelift and we, did, we put fat in her cheeks and in her upper eyelids. Just looking at her eyes uh, alone, uh, that took a few decades off of her face, not to mention the frown line around her mouth is gone the neck is smoother. The goal is the goal is to have these people look at themselves. I think the stigma against uh, facelift is people look at facelifts that were done 40 years ago, and they were all great surgeons. It was just the way we looked at facial rejuvenation was a little different. We thought a, pull, a pulled old face would be a youthful face, and we ignored uh, the, the, the volume. We didn't have the knowledge nor the technology to be able to 
inject fat in people's faces. The, many of the face the things we do these days are not technically that much different from what we did a few decades ago. But the fat grafting uh, is what changed the game. Look at her lips, the luscious lips on the after the photo and the very sad and thin lip on the, on, on the, on the before photo. Same patient, different view. I mean, uh, you tell me if she looks pulled or different or fake. This is, this is as natural as these results get. Patient from a different view. Now, this is a very interesting case, right? She doesn't have much going on in her face. She has, uh, she has a very face. She doesn't want to have scars in her face, but she hated the bands in her neck. You can see the platysmal bands in her neck. So patients like her can get a neck lift. And you can see how the bands are gone in the after photo. This is her one week after the surgery. Again, is she black and blue? Yeah, she's like green and yellow, a little bit of bruising. She's completely functional at home. The procedure that we did was a small incision under the chin, and we sewed the muscle edges back together. There's not much going on in her face, so she didn't really need much improvement. But look at the very small jowl that she has in her jawline. That didn't improve. She didn't want a facelift, and we had very, she was very clear about that the jowl wasn't even her problem. So when you do a neck lift, your, your scar ends around your earlobe and goes behind your ear into your hairline. This is not a surgery that has any potential to improve the jowls or the jawline. The moment we talk about jowls, we're talking about the lower facelift, which the scar involves like every single one you've seen so far, the entire ear into your um, uh, sideburns. So another dramatic improvement, right? She looks sad. She has lost a lot of volume, uh, not just around her eyes, not around her eyebrows, but also look at her chin. She lost, you lose volume, you lose bone density everywhere, including in, in, in your chin. Uh, this is her after a facelift and fat injection. Look at what a difference it made to put fat in her chin. She doesn't have a chin augmentation. Quite honestly, she needed it. But majority of my patients, the, for some reason, they have something against implants and they don't want to have a chin implant. Now, our methods are good enough that we can do almost a mini chin implant without doing the implant and just doing fat injection. You can see the improvement, the very strong jawline she has, the nasolabial fold near your neck lines are all uh, gone. And she didn't even have a lower eyelid lift. I think one of your, somebody in the audience asked, what do you do for the hollowness in the lower eyelid? Well, this is an example of fat injection to both upper and the lower eyelid. And you can see she has that strong look back because she regained the volume both in the upper and the lower eyelid. So one of our viewers is asking, is there a reaction? Can you get a reaction when injecting fat as opposed to fillers? Neither one of them are very reaction prone. Could you get complication? Yes, you could get complication from both of them. Um, there, if you inject it into an artery, whether it's fat or filler, they could equally cause complication, which is a whole different talk for itself. I'm not here to tell you, you know, fat is better than filler. But if you're in the surgery for any reason, uh, taking fat and putting it in the face, you can, you can do a lot more with fat. I think it's much more versatile in my hands because I'm a surgeon. And there are a lot of people that do a lot of injection with fillers. And um, without getting into cost, I truly think doing a full face of, with fillers is going to be much more costly than doing fat injection to the face. So now a lot of people come in in your lecture, Dr. Hakimi, I know I need a facelift, but I really don't want to have a facelift. I'm not ready. I'm too busy and I'm scared. I want to do something before I do the facelift. This is, uh, this is a very young patient with laxity in her lower uh, part of her face. So you can see on the, la on the profile view, she has a, a moderate amount of laxity in her neck and in her jowls, right? She's lost that angle of her jaw and she almost has a very obtuse angle from the skin hanging. Uh, patient, uh, on the right side, it's her three months after a radiofrequency skin tightening. You can see the amount of improvement in her neck. The jawline is stronger. Is, does this look like one of my facelift patients? No, but she also didn't have surgery. She didn't go under general anesthesia. This is a procedure that takes about an hour, an hour and a half under local anesthesia and has about seven days of swelling and bruising. No pain, no real restrictions of what you can or cannot do after the procedure. And over the next three to six months, this procedure causes skin retraction and improves the, the contour of your neck and your jaw. Some people, that's all they want. Some people want to use this to fill the gap for the next 10 years or so until they mentally are prepared to have a facelift. Same patient from a different view. Again, that neck in and of itself does, does look like a neck lift result. Uh, the jowls are still there. Are they better? They're much better. The, the marionette lines are better. The jawline is sharper, but then again, not a surgical result.
Can I just ask a few questions from the ladies? One is, how long does the fat last before it has to be done again? It's, it's not a perfect science. And it's a very good question. In my hands, I quote my patient 60% retention, meaning um, at the end of two or three months after the surgery, you will be left with 60% of the results. And whatever you have at the end of three year, three months, you're going to have it for the rest of your life. You, if you gain weight, you gain weight everywhere, including your face. If you lose weight, you lose weight everywhere. Um, do you need to repeat it? Every time I do fat grafting, there's an understanding with the patient that there's a chance that none of the fat might, might stay and you might have to come back and repeat the procedure. And knock on wood, I haven't had one yet that has had zero take, um, but could, could it be less than 60% retention and you have to come back and repeat the procedure one more time? It's very possible. But then again, majority of our patients, uh, I can't think of maybe like one patient for the last five years I've had to repeat their uh, fat grafting because they wanted more volume. So can you inject fat without a lift? Depends. Depends on how lax your face is. If, if you have too much laxity and the in infrastructure in your face is not strong enough or tight enough to hold fat in position, if you put fat in your cheeks, you're much more likely to migrate south and have an unnatural look. Um, have I done people in their 60s and 70s with fat injection? Yes, but it, it depends on how lax your face is. So the question was a little loaded, yes and no, depends on the degree of laxity that you have. It's not a requirement to have a tight skin to get, to get um, fat injection, but there's also a clinical judgment that we have to make if your skin is able to hold the fat in position or not. Now, 67 year old, severe neck laxity. 10 years ago, I would tell her, you can't even have a neck lift. You need to have a full on facelift for that much skin to go away. And look at her six months post a radio frequency procedure. Her jawline is sharp. Her, she has what, 80%, 70% improvement in her neck. Um, this would be, you know, a lot of people's uh, facelift result a year or two after. You know, depending on the degree of laxity, um, you can get this much improvement with, uh, with radio frequency. Same patient from a different view. You can see as, as we age, one of the things that happens is your skin and the fat layer gets so loose, it's hard to tell where the jaw ends and face starts. But what the radio frequency does a great work at is making the jawline uh, delineate so much sharper. Now, what if you have fat in your neck, right? We all hear about cool sculpting, Kybella, um, there are all these double chin treatments. Uh, the problem with all of them is none of, the, none of the ones currently available in the market do much for skin tightening. So it's fine if you're 30, 25, maybe early 40s with a lot of fat in your neck and then you get cool sculpting or Kybella done after a few sessions of treatment, you can get improvement in your neck. But what's gonna happen to, the, to, to this uh, skin? Every, probably every couple of weeks, I have one patient that comes in and says, I wish I knew I was trading off a full neck for, for an old neck because now the fat is gone and my, my skin is hanging. Now I look old. Um, the beauty of radio frequency is we can dial it to uh, adjust the heat so that you, you melt the fat as, and then you, 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 you uh, treat the skin for skin retraction. It's still the same procedure. It still takes only one hour. Um, it's, on, it's only one week of swelling and bruising with no real restrictions. You will have a chin strap for about a week to wear. But this is a result that she gained uh, without any surgery, no scars, and in one treatment, you can see the improvement in her jawline and the uh, improvement in her uh, skin laxity in her neck. Next so Elizabeth slide. wants to know how long is this non-surgical tightening last? Um, and just like any other surgical uh, procedures, I tell patients, you know, five to seven years, but I also tell them you go to, to the gym, you spend time and money getting a trainer, you invest for six months, you get some results. If you don't maintain, you don't go to the gym, you do your exercise, you're gonna lose everything that you gain during that training uh, session of six months or so. So why do we treat our skin? That's the biggest organ any differently, right? You, you, you invest in some sort of skin tightening procedure, whether surgical or non-surgical, don't ignore it for the next 10 years and hope that you will have a full 10 years of uh, a run with it. Um, facials doing, you know, there are lesser invasive radio frequency procedures that constantly stimulate your skin to make more collagen and stay youthful. The night creams, the Retin-A, the hydroquinone, all of these, they do play a role in um, maintaining the results. But 
five to seven years is what I quote to my patients. And that seems to be the case for average patient. Same patient, different view. I mean, she, you couldn't tell again where the neck ends and face starts and she has a very nice chin, uh, jawline and a dramatic improvement in her neck. Is it a facelift like result? No, but she also didn't have surgery. Once in a while, someone comes like this and looks like a facelift result. I'll be very happy if my facelift looks like this. Again, somebody in their uh, late fifties, her main complaint was the jaw and the, and the neck. You can see two things we did in this case. We did radio frequency for skin tightening, but we also augmented her chin in her jawline with a little bit of fat. You can see that she's lost bone density in the back of her, uh, her uh, jawline. And now after the fat injection, she has a very strong athletic look. Same patient from a different view. You can see the improvement in her jawline and um, skin tightening. Now fat injection, we've talked about it briefly throughout the today. It's something that I love doing because I think I can do a lot with it in one session. Um, this is a patient with, uh, she had nothing done except fat injection to her face. Yes, she has makeup on, but look at the hollowness around her eyes. Look at the loss of volume in her cheeks and the temple area uh, and focusing on her cheeks just from left to right before and after. This is a six month post follow-up. So she has actually a very decent amount of fat retention in her in her face and that's all she wanted not to go for frequent injections uh lips right um i have a lot of patients that don't like to look like a certain housewives of uh, certain cities uh, and i always tell them fat injection doesn't even have the capacity to make you look like anybody else um, fat if you put too much fat or put fat in a very tight space the fat is going to die because there won't be any way for the blood supply to reach the fat so all it can do by nature is to give you that oomph that you used to have. The, 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 the lines inside the red part of your lip are, are from loss of volume over, over years. This is a patient that had fat injection to her lips, you know, three months later. She doesn't look like she was done. The lips are definitely improved. You can see it's almost double the volume of the lower lip, uh, but she also doesn't look done. To the person in the audience that asked about what to do with the hollowness under the eyes, this patient, you would look at her and you would say, she probably needs a lower eyelid lift, right? She needs that fat that we talked about to be taken out from inside her eyelids because she doesn't have that much skin laxity. All she had was fat injection. Her problem was more fat loss in her cheek than it was fat protrusion from here. This is her three months after fat injection around her face without any sort of fat herniation or lower eyelid lift. And you can see the dramatic improvement in her look. Okay, that was it for me. I don't know how soon I got it, but... Um, I'm open for any questions at this point. So when you inject fat, mm -hmm. and once the fat is melted, will that enhance platysmal bands in the neck? No. No, the fat injection is only for the face. Um, we don't routinely fat graft the neck to cover the, 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 the muscle. Very good thinking, Meryl. It has come up in a couple of plastic surgery meetings, but uh, we don't do that, no. It's, the neck is way too dynamic and way, way too unsupported to hold onto the fat. What do you think about threads? I got to ask that question. Please, threads work and they do great for six months to one year. So if all you want is, you know, I'm okay with coming back every every year, every six months to, to lift my cheeks or my jawline, that's fine. In my opinion, they work better in the face than they work in the neck because in the neck, again, you don't have that much support to pull anything to, but I've seen good results on the cheek area. I just don't like to do things that don't that last six months to one year. Um, I also, we did a lot of radio frequency procedures at Liftique and it melts the sugar in threads. And when I take history from patients that are signing up for radio frequency, I always tell them, listen, I know you've spent my money and time doing the thread lift. The procedure you're about to sign up, it's gonna melt it. And nine out of 10 say, uh, you know, I didn't see much result after a few months anyway. So they, that, that tells you a lot about the procedure. So I'm getting a lot of questions about the cost difference between surgical and non-surgical. And I sure. think, you know, it's hard for you, you know, ladies, you never have um, Dr. Akimi discuss that, but I'd like to introduce Nicole Titcomp, who is our sales consultant and um She's an incredible woman. And I'd like to bring her on with you, Dr. Akimi, if we can. Hi, everyone. Hi, Nicole. Hi, how are you? So like you heard, we're getting questions about cost. 
Yeah, that's a hard call. When Dr. Akimi meets with our patients, everyone has their own personal uh, menu, as we like to call it, that he puts out for you. Like you heard a lot of the facelift that he does, you saw them also adding the fat crafting procedure and some of our other procedures that you saw, they'll add other things. So to give an entire estimate is kind of um, hard. Um, not everyone is a good candidate for just radio frequency. Some patients are a good candidate for profound and then of course surgical aspect of surgery, which does entail um, general anesthesia costs and OR fees. So it would just be best to come in for a consult. Let Dr. Hakimi um, go over all of the options for you. And then I have no problem laying out everything. We always give you several options to choose from. Um, things that you know, are non-surgical all the way up to surgery, whatever he feels you're the best candidate for. So Nicole, let's talk about our Liftique med, med Spa. So the Med Spa is absolutely amazing at Liftique. We literally have everything for everyone and every age. And that's what I love about our Liftique Med Spa. Um, if you just want to come in, you want to detoxify, you want to clean out your skin, we've got that for you. If you're worried about skin pigmentation, sun damage, we have that for you. I just did an IPL. Um, during COVID, while the gyms were closed, I had to walk and run and hike like so many other people and get outside to do my exercise. So with that came sun damage. So the IPL laser treatment, absolutely amazing to clear up that. We have the skin pin now, which helps with any kind of um, any issues that you had with maybe somebody who had acne issues, um, marks on the face. Uh, we have clear and brilliant treatments. We have um, so many things for everybody. And of course, our amazing Botox and fillers um, for every area of the face, like Dr. Akimi can go over with you, but there's so many um, areas that everyone loves to have treatments for. All, everyone who attended um, today's event, Dr. Akimi's $200 consultation fee is waived. Normally when you call to get in with him, we get a $200, but that fee is waived for you. Um, you can book uh, your consultation by Friday. Um, this Friday, September, well, that says September 11th, but- It's October. That was, that was <laughs> a, a, we're with you on this one, yes. Um, you do need to hold your appointment with a credit card just in case there's a no-show no uh, charge, but as long as you call us 24 hours in advance, you will not be charged on that credit card.